So I remember driving down the street in Los Angeles with tears running down my eyes. And I was looking for a Bible-based church. You see, I started my life as a failure. I started as a failure. With the tears running down my eyes, I was asking the question, God, where are you? If, if God, you exist, I need to know you. My life was a mess. <laughs> I'm not a motivational speaker. Far from it. And so one day I walked into Denny's, a restaurant just by the airport in Los Angeles, and I saw a group of African-American people. Um, I think I was in the first year in law school then. And I just went out to have some breakfast. And a group of black Americans, African-American men and women gathered to pray. They were praying. And I just ordered my food. And I looked and I said, this is amazing. These people are praying. I need to walk up to them and find out who they are and where they worship. You see, as a young lad, I grew up in a family, very good family, by God's grace, a middle-class family, and my parents gave us everything we needed, and they were wonderful parents. My mother is still alive. My father is past now. Great parents. We used to go to church, and after one hour, you know, I would dash out from church. I never read the Bible. In fact, sometimes I didn't even understand the sermon. Sometimes the sermon was in Latin. <laughs> it was in Latin, so I didn't even understand. I couldn't comprehend what the pastor was saying or, or the priest was saying. And so I grew up, listen, I grew up failing from Jump Street, ab initio, like we say in law, from the beginning. I was already a failure. And so I walked into the restaurant, they were praying, and I went up to them and said, can I, who are you? Who are you people? You sit and you pray, this is amazing. What church do you go to? And that conversation started the change in my life. I was 26 years old. I'm 52 now. I've worked with Jesus for 26 years of my life. If you, if you put a gun here and tell me to denounce him, you would have to blow my head off. I will literally die on this stage. Because let me, tell you this, let me tell you a secret. Well, it's not a secret, you know. Just like the gentleman said, without God in your life, I don't care who you are. I don't, I don't, I don't really care who you are. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> you see, there is heaven and hell. Somebody says, oh, there's no heaven and hell. Well, what if there's heaven and hell? Are you willing to play Ludo? What, what if there is heaven and hell? You want to take that risk? Even if there's no heaven and hell, and you tell me there's no heaven, heaven and hell, guess what? As I follow Jesus in the Bible, my, the, the level of peace in my life here on planet Earth. So either way, I win. But I'm not ready to take that risk. Oh, yes. And so from birth to 26, I really didn't know who I was. Uh, that's why I love to be here today. Pastor Gandhi, may God bless you. Please clap for the pastor. Thank you so much. Who, who am I to stand here in a church? Who am I? Yeah, nothing. You're nothing without Jesus. Forget it. Don't let anybody fool you. You're nothing without Jesus the Christ. And to the first lady of the house, may God bless you, madam. Thank you so much. The pastors in the house, the protocol, the guys who picked me up from uh, Washington Dulles yesterday. I mean, this church is amazing. Clap for this church. Je Jesus House DC. <laughs> man. Oh man, the, the hospitality here has been amazing. I'm sure my wife's going to be very jealous of me. You know, all, all, all the stuff they've done for me in DC. But you see, I, I came today to share two things with you essentially. Biazo. The word Biazo, I asked Pastor Gandhi, where did that come from? And he told me the story about this building and how the church had to be resilient and to fight the battles to get the church. 
So it's about taking things by force. Biazo. Two things I want to share with you today from God's word and my own life. You know? And that is number one. How do you determine who you are in life? How do you? Who are you? You know, the other day I asked a group of, you know, maybe 50 people, who are you? Somebody said, my name is, somebody says I'm married. Somebody says I'm a mother. Somebody says I'm a banker. Somebody says, and in my mind I said, yes, that's because I'm asking you who you are. Have you ever taken the time to sit and ponder, who am I? Forget anybody asking you the question. Can, can you do an introspective search and ask, who am I? I wonder if anybody in this church has ever done that. And so God tells us in Ephesians 2 and 10, he says, amazing, I didn't even know this until I started studying the Bible. By the way, once I gave my life to Christ, they took me to the ocean somewhere in, was it Malibu or Santa Monica? I can't remember. Dropped me into the water, baptized me. Then I took the Bible. I took the, the best book in the world, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Living Earth. B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Living Earth. The Bible is the greatest book on this planet. And I took it from page one to the last page and dissected it. You know, I'm a lawyer by training, you know, so we read, we read a lot. And I practiced law in LA for many years. I don't practice law anymore. I took that book called the Bible from page one to the last page. I was searching because I was born into the world a failure. And the reason why I had failed up till 26 was because I didn't know who I was. So all my decisions, everything I did was based on who I thought I was. What the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 10, it says, we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. And he has made us for good works. In fact, he prepared the good works before time started. That, that for me, I, I didn't even understand that. You mean a God created me, prepared the work for me before I was born. So what am I doing? What was I doing till 26? How come somebody could not tell me about this God? And so through pain and suffering, let me tell you a secret about another secret of life. Pain is one of man's greatest teachers. Let me repeat that. You didn't hear me. I'll say it again. Pain. Say with me, pain. No, I didn't hear you. Pain. Pain is one of man's greatest teachers. Failure is one of man's best teachers. Until you fail, you will never be great in the kingdom of God. Until you go through pain, you want an example? Look at Jesus the Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he failed. Think about every great man and woman in the Bible. You will see somewhere in their lives, they were crushed. Look at Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, on the, on the road to Damascus. He was crushed, blind. Today, after Jesus the Christ, is Paul. Jesus, Paul. After Jesus, is Paul. Even from prison, he was writing. You can't escape pain. Pain. It was pain that brought me to Jesus. So, anything that brings you to Jesus to get you to know who you are, no matter how painful it is, is good for you. As long as the pain drives you to God, that pain is good. And so today I've come with eight things based on the Holy Bible and based on Almost 30 years of research, failure, pain in my life, and a bit of success that God has given me. You see, I'm a product of failure. I'm a product of pain. But thank God today, Jesus is Christ in my life. Without failure and pain, I'm talking to somebody here. Somebody is going through something. Without failure and pain, I'm telling you, stop fighting it. Sometimes God allows pain in your life to humble you. That was my story. You know, uh, first degree in architecture, Juris doctorate degree, California licensed lawyer, blah, 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 blah. You're nothing without Jesus. You're nothing. You'll perish and go to hell. You will perish and go to hell. Don't let anybody fool you. You'll perish. And so the first thing I want to share with you today is there are eight things you must pay attention to. 
if you're going to figure out who you are. Eight. By the way, just before I start, the eight, I want to tell you about Romans 9 and 23. You know, in Romans 9, 23, I love that scripture. In the New King James Version, it basically says that we, believers, are vessels of God's mercy. Hmm. You're, you're a vessel of God's mercy. And in fact, you are a vessel of God's mercy because he had prepared you for the good works. In other words, you cannot be a subject of good works until you enjoy the mercy of God. So God's mercy is very critical. The first thing that we need to define who we are, the eight-part framework, is values. You can never discover who you are until you formalize your values. What do I mean? I'm talking about positive, godly values. So before 26, hear me, I, I, I did not have positive, godly values to lead my life. I had values, but they were not godly. Everybody has values. For example, if your value system is greed, you'll be corrupt. True or false? Yes. If you, if you value greed, then you will take a bribe. Yes. You will take a bribe. You will give a bribe. Yes. They give you a job, a contract to do it. You will inflate it because your value is great. Now, what is a value? Simple. A value is a principle, hmm. a guideline that governs, listen, your thoughts, your actions, and ultimately your decision making. A value is a principle, is a guideline, is a rule of law that governs you. Hmm. I sat down one day and I wrote down 19 things that I must live my life based on. And then, out of the 19 things, I reduce them to seven buckets. So today in my life, I lead life based on seven values. And I will perish for these values. I told you, please, I'm not arrogant. Honestly, if God can save me, I'm one of the most humble men. But if you put a gun to my head today and ask me to denounce Jesus on this stage, I've told my wife that, you will, will have to kill me. Honey, I go. I told my wife the other day, I said, I will go. You got to blow my head off. I will not turn my back on Jesus. After what he has done for me, never. And don't let anybody fool you. For example, it's biblical. In 1 Timothy 6 and 11, New King James, he says, you man of God. He's talking to you. He says, the man of God, live life based on godliness, righteousness, patience. It, it, it enumerates the values we should live life based on. It's biblical. In 1 Timothy 6 and 11, it tells you, look at what it says. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. The Bible enumerates particulars in terms of values. So let me tell you my seven values, if you don't mind. The first is godliness and family. That's number one. Everything I do as a human being that's how you know who you are. You, when you, I told my daughter, Rema, she's 16. I said, Rema, when they ask who your father is, don't tell anybody your father is a lawyer or an emotional intelligence expert. No. The way you describe your daddy is to say, my father is a man who leads life based on seven values. Your values are who you are. That's number one. I don't know whether I'm talking to somebody here. The first is godliness and family. So, you see that my little wife back in Nigeria, her name is Dr. Azuka. If you shoot a bullet, I will take it to leave my wife. If you shoot, bah, bah, you will kill me, leave her. Yes, yeah, so I take a bullet for her. That woman was there when I had nothing. You didn't hear me. She was there when I didn't have what they call shishi kaba. Well, let me translate for that. I didn't have jack. <laughs> Now somebody will come and tell me that they want to mess with my wife. You can't. Or my children. The woman married me when I didn't have nothing. They told her, don't marry him. He doesn't have money. And truly, I didn't have money. <laughs> oh, yes. She was doing very well. She said, I'm going to marry him. Whether I ask money or not, I love him. You hear me? So somebody will come and tell me something. I can't. 
Or if I, I there are pretty, Pastor Colette, there are pretty women everywhere. Yesterday, coming from Nigeria, I traveled with one of them. Very pretty. <laughs> Immediately, my eyes caught attention. I just say, in Jesus' mighty name, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, at this Washington Dulles airport, we landed at Atlanta. She followed me on the same plane. I said, devil, you are looking for my trouble. And I tell you the truth, very pretty. Very good looking. But only one woman is pretty in my eyes. And that's my wife. That's my wife. Madam, she came and, you know, this train that carries us from one place to the other, one get we're standing again. She's next to me. She wants to enter. You know what I did? The train came. I said, you enter the, I'm coming. <laughs> I, I entered the next one. <laughs> you asked me, who am I? I am my values. I am not Chike Onya. I am not a California lawyer. I am nothing. Mm -mm. First, I am what? You are your value. What are your values? Let me tell you. Be ready to die for them. Number one. Number two, you will suffer for them. You didn't hear me. Jesus the Christ, he suffered. He had a value system that says, I am the son of God and I came here to die. He didn't want to die in the garden of Gethsemane. Your values, as you live your values, you will suffer for doing what is right. Guess what? Who cares? Suffering is a part of life. I don't care. If you like, if you, I don't care. I tell people, cultivate a high threshold for pain and suffering. Suffering won't kill you as long as he's doing it for what is right. It won't kill you. Get used to it. Jesus suffered. Some of us Christians were weaklings. I used to be a weakling until I decided these are my values and I'm ready to perish. If I perish, I perish. I don't care. And I won't perish. The Hebrew boys, did they perish? Those Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. The king says, bow. He said, you are mad. I won't bow. You're a madman. I won't bow. They said, look, I'm coming in. Even if God decides to save me, fine. Even if he doesn't. You see, you must get to a place in your prayer life. Whether God answers or not, you follow him. I told God, even if you say there's no heaven and hell, I will still follow you. If you don't answer any prayer again, I will still follow you. Get to a place where God is not about answering your prayers. Get beyond that. Glory to God. I told the devil, you are a madman. You are messing with somebody who knows who he is. You are messing with the wrong man. You don't know me. I'm a militant when it comes to Christianity. If I perish, I perish and I won't perish. Glory to God. I'm watching my time, you know. My time is limited. <laughs> so my values, there's godliness family. Number two, listen to me. There's contentment and gratitude. How do I know? Look at Apostle Paul. I love it. He says, hey, in little and plenty, I am what? Learn to be content in your life. Stop looking at other people, trying to figure out who you are. Be grateful for what God has given you. You didn't hear me. Glory to God. You know, I keep a gratitude journal. Mm. This morning, Pastor, Pastor Gandhi, as I said my morning prayers, Pastor, I sat down on my gratitude journal. I journal daily one thing. I said, Father, thank you so much. I am, I have, you know what I wrote today, Pastor Colin? I wrote, Father, thank you. I can see. That's the only thing today. I put today's date, April 14, 2019, on my knees. I wrote it down. I said, Father, thank you. I can see. Look at you. You can see. Some people are blind. And you are here, chicken, complaining and grumbling about what is wrong with you? Wake up, you are a weakling. Wake up. Wake up. Hmm. The third, just the values. I give a few. You should have yours. What are your values? One value for me, listen, hard work, world-class excellence in all I do. Hmm. And originality is a principle I live by. I don't believe in microwave success. You have to work hard in life. If you don't work hard, you're not going anywhere. World-class excellence. I live in Lagos. 
But everything I do in my company, listen, it must pass muster. It must pass the litmus test in Dubai, London, New York, Paris. Even though I'm in Lagos, when I write a report based on my values and who I am, when you showcase that report, it will pass the test in Dubai. It will pass New York. It will pass London. It will pass in Paris. What class? Not all these stories. Stories. You know, I'm a Nigerian. But I'm very sad by what I see happening in my country. Nigerians are one of the most educated globally. In fact, my understanding, I'm a lawyer. I understand now, on, at the Harvard Law School, you may have heard it, at the Harvard Law School, we have the first Nigerian female professor at the Harvard Law School. Yes, let's clap for her. Anyway, let me move on. So the first is your values. I want to encourage you today, you will not know born identity. You were created by God for good works, but you can never know who you are until you have a set of values. And I want to recommend the first value should be godliness. Godliness. The second thing that defines you out of eight. So the first is what? Are you following me? The first is what? Your values. The second thing, and this this, you may not agree, but follow me. I've done the research for many years, and it's biblical. The second thing that defines you, listen, who you are, you are your talents, your gifts, your strengths, and the skills you acquire. That's who you are. I repeat, you are your talents, you are your gifts, you are your strengths, and the skills you acquire. Yes, you are. The Bible says, a gift of a man does what? Oh, Jesus the Christ. The gifts of a man. Mm, I love it. In Proverbs 18, 16. The Bible is clear. Look, a man's gift. Think about, and I'm not here talking about money. Forget money. Think about the most successful people today. Those who are wealthy, from Serena Williams, to Usain Bolt, to our own Ahmed Musa from Nigeria. He's playing soccer in Saudi Arabia. The last time I checked, Saudi Arabia is paying him $20 million. When he arrived Saudi, the Saudis were there to welcome him. What are your gifts and talents? A lot of us are mediocre in what we do. We keep following the crowd. We don't know who we are. God has given you a talent, a gift, so that you can do the good works on planet Earth. Listen, until you begin to operate in your talents, your life is not complete. You know, my first degree is in architecture. I studied architecture. Then I studied law. What was I doing studying architecture and law? Looking for myself. Trying to figure out, Chike, who are you? It took me almost 40 years to figure it out. I wish somebody had taught me what I'm teaching you here now. It took me almost 40 years to figure out, who, who are you? From architecture to law, are you confused? But today, this is all I do. I talk. God has given me, with all humility, a little gift just to open my mouth. Just open your mouth and say something. Please don't be offended. I told somebody the other day, I lived in LA for 22 years. Today in Nigeria, when I open this little mouth that God has given me and speak for one hour, I didn't see that money in California for one hour. Even practicing law, I didn't see it. Please don't be offended. I'm not arrogant. I'm teaching you about who you are. Until you discover your talents, your gifts, your strength, and begin to play in it, you are not. <laughs> you're not ready to deliver kingdom stuff. It's also about the skills you acquire. So you become the skills you acquire. It's biblical. You become the skills you acquire. The more skills you acquire. For example, as a lawyer running my own law firm in L.A., do you know that I never took a course on financial intelligence? How am I supposed to keep my books? So you teach me the practice of law. But well, what about the business of law? And are you with me? You, you got to read financial statements. What about the stock market? What about the capital market? The money market? What about real estate investments? You never taught me anything about money. I was an illiterate financially until I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. 
Then I realized, Chike, you, you need help. There's certain skills you don't have. I don't care how educated you are. You need to acquire skills. So the second thing that defines you, your gifts, your talents, your strengths, and the what? And the skills you what? You acquire. For example, emotional intelligence is a skill. We'll talk about that in a minute. The third thing, the third thing that would define you. So we're, we're walking through who you are. I'm giving you an eight-part framework of who you are. Listen, the third thing that tells me who you are are your goals. What are your goals in life? What are your goals? Check out Apostle Paul. I love it. In Philippians 3, eh, Apostle Paul says, I love what he says. He says, this is Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He says, brethren, I do not count myself of apprehended all of this stuff. I forget everything that is behind me, but one thing I will do, I press towards the goal. I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You know, in my little wallet, in my little wallet, I have a piece of paper I carry in that wallet everywhere I go. In that wallet, I've written seven goals I must satisfy by God's grace before I die. I'm 52, so I carry, I've written all my goals on one sheet of paper. And the, the job for me is every morning, I need to look at those goals carefully. Your goals tell me who you are. Your goals keep you focused in life. Apostle Paul was very focused. He says, I count all this as refuse. Ah, uh, you remember the word of God. He says, I count it as dumb, as refuse. He says, but this one thing, what was that? Knowledge of our Lord Jesus the Christ. What are your goals in life? I, I asked about 30 people the other day. I said, how many of you in 2018 set a goal? Only three people raised their hand. Out of 30 people, only three, that's 10%. Then I said to them, how many of you wrote it down? Everybody's hand went down. When you set a goal like Apostle Paul, you need to have milestones, action points. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. So the first goal in that piece of paper, out of seven goals, was by 2019, write and publish a bestseller book in emotional intelligence. That was the goal. Like Apostle Paul, I am my goals. Without goals, you have no direction. Who are you? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know who you are. Where are your goals? For example, somebody comes and tells me, farming is raining in Nigeria. I'll say, hold on a minute. Let me check my goals. Is farming inside here? No, farming is not here. No, no, no. I'm not going with you. If I have some money and I trust you, I can be a venture capitalist. I'll put equity there. You'll pay me dividends. They say, ah, okay, forex trading is raining now. Forex trading. I say, wait a minute. Is it inside here? There's no forex trading here. I'm not following you. You become your goals. And so I said, write this book in 2019. You know what I did? I finished writing the book February 11th of this year. A book on emotional intelligence. Yes, by the grace of God, I'll publish this year. And for the month of March, so I finished February, I'm talking about who you are. How do I know you? Your goals. Month of March, I said, hire a business consultant to write a business plan. The book is like a product. The book is like an iPhone. I'm not just going to publish and start selling, selling book. Mm -mm. I hired a business consultant to write a what? A business plan. What is the product? What are the issues out there? Do a SWOT analysis. What is the market where I'm going to sell this book? How do I sell it? In the month of April, that's this month, I'm in the US now, talk to the lawyers in California, copyright lawyers, to write a whole brief for me on copyright laws because I've cited people in that book. I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. I need to know what the law is, where I need to get consent. I'm going to trademark the name of the book, etc., etc. So the month of April, both in Nigeria and the U.S., I'm hiring intellectual property attorneys to write the brief for me. Month of May, hire an event planner to start the planning of the launch. What are your goals in life? Apostle Paul had a goal. Are, are you with me so far? All right, number four. Number four. Hmm. You're going to... You will, you will like this one. Number four, guess what? You are your weaknesses 
your temperamental defects and the need to change. You are your weaknesses, your temperamental defects and the need to change. You are your weaknesses. Oh yes, you are your weaknesses. Ephesians 2, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, it says, before you and I were born again, we were being ruled by the prince of the air. We were children of wrath, children of the prince of the air. If you have a weakness called sin, you need to address it. If you have a weakness called, let me tell you who you are. You are your weaknesses. You are any temperamental defects. What is a temperamental defect? Let me tell you. Your temperament is genetically encoded in you. So there's some people who are choleric. They're very bullish and domineering. There are people who are melancholy. I'm a melancholy, a perfectionist. Others are sanguine, very full of life, super extroverted. And some are timid and reserved. Those are the phlegmatics. So you have the cholerics, you got the sanguines, you got the melancholies, and you got the flags. I'm a melancholy. My wife is not like me. Every, in my bookshelf, everything must be neatly organized. And anybody that touches is going to look for my trouble. My wife is the exact opposite. She can come in, I love her to death. Her sh one shoe will be here. Another shoe will be there. Leave the matter. No wahala. So in the first few years of marriage, it was a problem. Because I'm a perfectionist, and she's the total opposite of me. A bit of choleric and, you know, a bit of a sanguine. She's choleric. So I have a wife who, who, who can be, who can say to me, she can be very domineering. But I love her. She's choleric. So, you know, she, she, can, she gives orders. Do this. Hey, <laughs> hey, Madam, me, me, I should go and do this, eh? No, Allah. <laughs> I'm sorry. She said, do this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so in the first few years of marriage, it was a problem. Yes, because the Bible says, I am the head of the home. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, are you? You are to submit to me. You know? Uh, no, Chike, it's not like that. The Bible says, I am the head of the home. There's no doubt. By, by virtue of my gender, I am the head of the Onya home. Nobody will take that away from me. No doubt. But before I expect my wife to submit, I first got to love her to death. In fact, the Bible tells me, listen to me now, the Bible is it's amazing. That Bible is amazing. That's why I do it's the best book in the world. The Bible says, you see this, your wife, you will love her the way Christ loved the church. Christ died for me. That's why I told you I would take a bullet for her. Then he says, you will wash her in the word. You will wash all the blemishes off of her and present her back. So when my wife is here, I say, honey, <laughs> no wahala. <laughs> no issues, man. <laughs> These days, when she's talking, my mouth is like this. Mm, cha -cha 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 -cha. My wife can't wake up. Eh? Just, hello, honey, good morning. <laughs> I say, honey, but he said, no, 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 I'm not done. Just listen. I'm coming. <laughs> hey, and you are fighting with your wife. Eh? Yeah, your mates are building empires and you are home fighting with your wife. <laughs> yeah. But believe me, as a man, once in a while, I put my foot down. Once in a while, I'll put my, honey, not today. Not today, eh? Not today, eh? You know I love you, but not today. No, 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 no. No, honey, not today. Uh, God bless you, my wife. No, 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 no not today, eh? <laughs> That's a bit of emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are your weaknesses? The point I'm making is that that's who you are. You need to go and walk on them. I'm a perfectionist. I need to back off a little bit. If not, my marriage is not going to be successful. You cannot bless anybody using that temperament. So you are your temperament. Those defects, you need to walk on them. Your weaknesses, is there sin in your life? You know, as Christians, we need to flee from sin. Look, that pretty woman I saw yesterday, 
Had I remained in her presence, oh God, she was sitting opposite me at the airport in Atlanta. When she came like this, I told the Yubo man here, I need to go and use the restroom. I just, because you, if you hang around too, too, too long there, the Bible says, listen, it says, this eyes, eh, you lost over a woman, you have committed adultery. The Bible says, listen to me very carefully, I'm talking to the men here, it's as if it's better for you to take out one eye than the rest of your whole body to go to hell. And you see me, I don't want to go to hell. No, I don't want to go there. So you have to run as fast as your legs can carry you. <laughs> uh, somebody is looking and saying, who is this crazy guy? You know what? I am crazy for Jesus. Because you see, before 26, I was a fool. I didn't know who I was. I didn't talk like this before 26. So I was a fool until Jesus arrested me. Yes, then your life will change. The next, let's keep going. So we've given you how many now? Are you with me? The first is what? What's the first one? Values. The second is what? Talents. Yes. The third is what? And the fourth is? Yes. Look at the fifth. Look at the fifth. The fifth that would define you, ah, uh, you're going to love this. Feedback. Write it down. You become, you are the feedback that you get from people around you. You really want to know who you are? You need to get feedback from people around you. How do I know? Look at David. When David sinned, aha, uh -huh, he killed Bathsheba's husband, didn't he? And it took Nathan to come in 2 Samuel 12, 7 to 14. It took Nathan to come to give him feedback, to say, Oga, oh you are guilty. You are guilty. So once a year in my office, in my home, I gather everybody that reports directly to me. My driver, Rafiu. Sit down, Rafiu. Tell me as your chief executive in 2018, how did I do? Did I do well? Tell me why I did well. Tell me the areas where I need to improve. And Rafiu gave me feedback. Rafiu said, Oga, you're a very nice guy. Very kind, very compassionate. But, <laughs> you see, you can never know who you are until once a year, you gather people to give you feedback. He said to me, Oga, when you are angry, hey, you don't shout, oh, you don't abuse us, you don't call us idiots. But the tone of your voice, sir, I start shaking. I, and I continue shaking for the rest of the day. Meanwhile, I refuse my driver. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, PG, I'm looking at my time. <laughs> Look, can I be honest with you? you? You will never know who you are as a Christian. Until you get feedback. My wife gives me feedback once a year. My executive assistant will give me feedback. My PA, Leko, gave me feedback. And I told my wife, domestically, everybody must give me feedback. So I, I said to my wife, Caro is our nanny. She watches the little ones. Please, wife, do I have your permission to ask? You can be present. I want to ask Caro, as the father here, how am I doing? You know what Caro told me? <laughs> You, you said you want to know who you are. You can never know who you are until you seek what? Feedback. Make it a routine once a year in January. And Caro said to me, sir, a very wonderful man. I did this a wonderful, sir. But, hey, that but is you. That, can I say this to you? All of us have blind spots here. You, you, you are not the best judge of who you are. That's why it took Nathan to tell David, you're guilty as charged. It's biblical. You know what she said to me? She said, sir, when, when you, let God, let God be the one blessing you, sir. Sir, this thing you do, like in meetings, weekly meetings domestically, when after you do something for us, you will come and announce what you have done in the meeting. <laughs> sir, please, eh? I don't like that thing. Stop announcing it. Let God bless you. Don't let, don't let anybody. You know what? What? Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Watch this carefully. Let me tell you what happened. See what happened. In the same clinic in Victoria Island, where my family treats, Carol 
was hospitalized for one or two days. I paid the bills. She's our nanny. We take care of her very well. Okay? She said to me, sir, you paid all this money. A lot of money, sir. But please, during meeting, eh, don't open your mouth and... <laughs> Oh God, Jesus, my time more. Oh. One of them, my executive assistant, Chris Anyangu. Chris said to me, sir, you are this, this, and this. Very good. But, but, oh God, sometimes you talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> so in the last meeting, Colette, Pastor Colette, in the last office meeting, I said, guys, after the, I, I talked, talk, I said, guys, hey, they said I talk too much. Yeah, so let me, let me land, summarize, and you people said I talk too much. You become the feedback you get from your people. You can never know who you are until you get the feedback once a year. That's who you are. You can't know it for yourself. After all, Jesus saved all of us. The next. Ah, you're going to love this one. I'm watching my time. All right. The next, number six. I love it. Listen to this before you write it. Can I say this to you? Don't write. You are not your past. You are the lessons from your past. That's who you are. You, 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 if you define yourself based on your past, you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. You are the lessons from your past. You are not your past. Mm, how do I know? So many scriptures. Forgetting what is behind you. Reaching out. I'll do a new thing in, in your life. Isaiah 43, 18, 19. Forget the old. I will do a new thing in your life. Can't you see it? I will put, I will put a path in the wilderness. I remember in 1987, ah, pastor like PG, oh God. You see, one thing God does with men, I don't know about women, but with men, you know what God does with them? With men who serve God legitimately, what God will do, eh, he will bring you, he will shatter your life. Remove all the pride or arrogance from you. Reduce you to zero. Dust you off. Then lift you up. Now you are very humble. And then he will present you to the world. So God speaking. That's the way God operates. How do I know? Look at what he did to his son Jesus. He sent him to the cross. Crucified him. He went down. And then with robbers. Isn't he God? Why did he have to kill his son, Jesus? I've always asked him that question. Father, why did you have to kill Jesus for this? Your God, you could have come up with a different strategy. Is it not true? But with men, God would, God would bring you down. He did that to me in my life. In 1987, you know, you must tell a story of your life. You can't minister to anybody without telling your story. You don't come and be quoting all kinds of things. You can use the scriptures, but bring your stories to life. People relate to your stories using the Bible. Yes, in 1987, I applied to do a graduate course in architecture. And the school I applied to, graduate course, they said, denied, declined. You are not admitted. You're not admitted. And to be a qualified architect... You need a master's degree in architecture. I just graduated from a university with a Bachelor of Science, second class upper. There was no first class student that year. There were six of us that had two ones. The rest were two twos and threes. The school, the graduate school I wanted to go to, I had high hopes of this graduate school. I packaged my portfolio and the graduate school said, your portfolio is substandard. You are not admitted to this school. In other words, you're a failure. You're worth nothing. You and your two one from this university, you're trash. Can I say something to you? In life, rejection will come. Failure will come. Pain will come. Let me tell you a secret about those things. <laughs> those things can become one of your best friends in life. When you learn to deal with rejection and pain and failure, oh my God, that thing took me to my knees, PG. It brought me down. I lost my confidence. 
I didn't know who I was. You know why? Because I defined myself based on my education. You are not your education. Let me tell you that. You're not your education. Education is a facilitator. It's a means to an end. It's not the end of itself. The goal of education, really, is to bring out the best in the student. To nurture their gifts and their talents and to help them to bless humanity. You are not your education. Look at me today. I'm a qualified lawyer. California licensed. I was bad so many years ago. Took that bar exam. Passed it the first time. But today, I'm not practicing law. You are not your education. Today, I'm not a qualified architect. I have a Bachelor of Science in Architecture. But the graduate school I wanted to go to declined the admission. You can't come in. Guess what? Six years later, I take the same Bachelor of Science and apply to a law school in California. To study law, you know that. You need to have a first degree. So the law school admitted me with the first degree and I went and studied law. And today, I have a Juris Doctorate degree. But at the end of the day, you're going to look at yourself as a failure. You are not a failure. You are the lessons from your failure. You know what I learned from that admission process? I had packaged that admission process and I had made some mistakes. I didn't get it right. So today in my life, when I look back and I say, wow, Chike, you're not your past. You are the lessons from your past. So everything I do today, I'm thorough, I'm meticulous, I'm focused, I don't play. That's who you are, the lessons from your past. Can I move on? All right. The next, number what is that? Number seven, yes. You are the choices and the consequences of your choices. Oh God, you're going to love it. You are your choices and the consequences of your choices. <laughs> you, you, the older you get in life, the more you are your choices in life. Look at what God says. I put before you today good and evil. Choose. Look, when you were younger, you and I were juveniles. We were juveniles and were delinquent. You could do something and get away with it as a juvenile. We rehabilitate you. But as an adult and a Christian, you become the choices you make. You become the choices and the consequences of your choices. Imagine what would have happened if I allowed my lust and emotions at the airport to get the best out of me. So I just come near the lady and I say to her, oh, hi, my name is Chike. How are you? You're very pretty. Can I have your number? And all of a sudden, <laughs> we're, taking, we're exchanging numbers and all that. Only for me to find out, for example, that this young lady is the younger sister of my wife's best friend. <laughs> or with the way technology is today, the way technology is, she just takes my number, looks me up. I'm Chike. She sees my face on Instagram or Facebook. She goes there and writes, say, oh, hi, it was nice meeting you at the airport today. And then my wife has access to my phone all the time. Also, not getting so Going out sweet boy. Pity, she's speaking to you I'm watching the time. Wow. My wife has 24-7 access to my phone. She answers my phone when I'm not around. If I'm in the bathroom, she picks the phone. She looks at my phone 24-7. I have nothing to hide. You know what I'm saying? I need to make heaven, man. When I die, I need to make heaven. No obstacle by the grace of God can stop me. I've suffered too much to live here and then go to hell again. No. I've suffered too much. Let me go and enjoy the mansions. I'm talking about in heaven. If I suffer here, I can't end up and suffer again. I ran away from that situation. You are the choices you make and the consequences of your choices. Listen to me. This is a very important thing. You become the choices. You are your choices. Number what? Finally, I love it. Notice something. Number one to seven will make you Listen, will make you successful as a Christian. In the world that you are prayed today, number one to seven will make you successful. Now, if you want to be great, 
you need to add number eight. Let me tell you the difference between success and greatness. Success is simply this. The ability to set a goal and achieve the goal. Once you set a goal and achieve your goal, you are a successful human being. But greatness is different. Listen to me. Greatness is about taking your success and blessing humanity. Taking your success and blessing the kingdom of God. Taking your success and blessing the people of God. That's, that's greatness. You want to be great? You need number eight. Number one to seven makes you what? And success is simply setting a goal. You said, listen to me. Stop trying to be like everybody else. Okay? I have a friend who is in oil and gas. He's GMD of one of Nigeria's number one oil and gas companies. When I got to Nigeria after 22 years, he, calls, he sends the chauffeur to pick me up. By the time the chauffeur arrives in his house, as I enter, come to the house in Nikoi, come and see the walls. It was like Dodan Barracks. It was, it was as if, I, I don't know what was happening there. Mobile police everywhere. As the car pulls into his compound, come and see the vehicle. It's as if they were selling cars there. G-Wagon, black, tinted. Range Rover, black, tinted. Have a Land Cruiser, black, tinted. Cadillac, what do you call it? Escalade, black, tinted. Hey! <laughs> if you don't know who you are, the society will define you. The culture would define you. The world would define you. Your peers would define you. Listen to me. Listen, listen. And people of God, you cannot allow those things to define you. If there are positive elements from those things, you can draw from them. But you are not the society. You are not the culture. You're not, you're not the world. You're in the world, but you're not of this world. That's what the Bible teaches. You're not. Finally, number eight is this. You are the relationships in your life, the people you influence, the people you impact, and those you touch. That's who you are. You are your relationships. The people you influence, the people you impact, and the people you touch on planet Earth. Look at Jesus the Christ. Look at Nelson Mandela. Talk about any of them. Look at Mother Teresa. <laughs> Anytime you talk about a great human being, you always talk about greatness in the context of touching other people's lives. Jesus was the greatest man that walked the planet. Look at, he saved me, saved you. Look at Nelson Mandela, 27 years in jail, came out and freed South Africa of apartheid. Look at Mahatma Gandhi of India. Look at Mother Teresa. You, you want to be great? You want to do some awesome things in God's kingdom? Have a good relationship with your wife, your husband. Have a good relationship with your in-laws. At work, have great relationships. Don't keep malice. Don't quarrel. You are your relationships. They say birds of the same feather. Do what? Show me your friends and I'll show you what? Ultimately, you become who you are. You become that person who, that you are based on your relationships. Jesus, the 12 disciples, the disciples of Jesus Christ... So if you're married, I want to know who you are, I'll talk to your spouse. I'll talk to your children. That's what I'll do. All right. So that's the first thing I wanted to cover here. I have 14 minutes to go. I'm going to wrap up. So that's, I, I, I hope that, and if you have any questions, you can write them down so that on Wednesday we can take them. But these eight things are so important in our lives. I wish I knew them earlier in my life. I wish I knew these eight things. So I, I want to plead with you to make sure you have these things incorporated into your life. As I begin to wrap up 14 minutes to go, I want to talk about another concept that is so important in our lives. And that concept is called Emotional intelligence, specifically in the area of resilience. Now, let me tell you why I want to talk about that briefly. I'm almost done. Remember, I said, I said to you, number two, the second thing that defines who you are. Can somebody remind me? What's the second thing that defines who you are? Your talents, your gifts, your strengths, and what? And the skills. The skills you acquire. There is one skill. 
There is one skill that is critical in the 21st century. And that skill is called resilience. It's called resilience. Because let me tell you, in your journey of who you are, in the journey of who you are, you're going to come against obstacles. You're going to have issues. There'll be problems in your life. And only resilient people overcome. And so I'll give you three things about resilient people and I'm done. Hmm. One of my favorite topics in the world. And why is it a part of emotional intelligence? Let me tell you why. Let me tell you. Look at emotional intelligence. It's my area of expertise. Very simple. What is emotional intelligence? Listen, very simple. Everybody in this room is an emotional human being. We all have emotions. The person sitting next to you has emotions. The ability to intelligently manage your emotions is the concept of emotional intelligence. The ability to bring intelligence to your emotions and the emotions of others is the concept of emotional intelligence. Specifically, resilience. So, for example, look at the three Hebrew boys in the Bible. I love it. Let me use them as I close. <laughs> the three Hebrew boys faced a problem in their lives. You will face a problem. Nobody escapes it in life. Nobody's immune. Nobody's exempt. Nobody's inoculated. As long as you live, you're going to face something in your life. You will go through pain. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. They tell you otherwise, you're, they're lying. Jesus went through pain. We were created in his image. You lose a job, you will go through pain. Yes, you will fail at something. That is not a negative testimony. It tells me you're human. You're going to miss a deadline. We don't pray for it, but it happens. We will all go through issues in life. You can't escape it. So since you can't escape it, why don't you learn three things the next time a problem comes to help you come through the problem. Look at the three Hebrew boys. See the first thing they did, and that's the first element of resilient people. Number one, listen. <laughs> they confront the brutal facts as is. Resilient people look at the facts. No matter how brutal the facts are, they come head on with it. How do I know? The three boys said, listen, we will not bow before this man. This is your nonsense idol. Nebuchadnezzar, go to hell. I love what they said. They said, look, our God, I love those boys. Those boys in the Bible next to Jesus and Paul are my favorite. They were the ones that taught me, even if God doesn't answer the prayer, I will follow him. They told the king, those boys are crazy. They, and they're crazy. They told the king, go, oh, in fact, let me come down for this. This is too serious. No, no, please, please follow me. Sorry. They, they, this is too serious. Have you ever seen some mad people like this? They told that king, look, God is able to deliver me or us. But even if he chooses not to deliver, I love it. You need to get to a place in your Christian life. Even if God doesn't answer the prayer, Forget it. Continue to follow him. You didn't hear me. Look, some people follow God because prayer is answered. The day he doesn't answer your prayer, what do you do? I know somebody who converted to Islam. He said God didn't answer his prayer, so he changed. He became a Muslim. I know him personally. I said, why? He said, oh God, this God we are talking about, he doesn't answer my prayer. So he converted. I know him personally. The first thing you got to do when you face pain in your life, you need to confront the brutal facts. Look the facts dead, head on. Go to hell. God is able to save me. But even if he doesn't save me, go to hell, man. I won't say that. I'm going in. They jumped inside that fire. Listen to me. You will go through pain in life. You will fail at something. You will go through troubles in life. It's a part of life. James chapter 1, the Bible says, count it all joy when you go through trials. He said, allow your faith to work, persevere. At the end of the day, you become complete, lacking nothing. Listen to me. So the Bible teaches that pain is a condition precedent. Pain is a prerequisite for greatness. How do I know? James chapter 1 verse 2, count it all joy when you go through diverse temptations. You will go through something. 
All this Christianity about prosperity, prosperity. Oh, we, we will be this, we will be that. Nobody is teaching us that you go through something in life. You will go through something in life. Nobody escapes it. And the first thing I said to do, confront the facts head on. Don't jive them. Your God is amazing. And as you confront the head, facts head on, brutally, you stand in prayer. You pray. Father, this thing will go. But even if it doesn't go, I'll follow you. And God is amazing. When you get to that place in your walk with God, when God sees, look at this young man or woman. You don't follow me because of what I'm going to give you. Look at that. God is looking for you here today. If you're not like that, change. I'm here from Nigeria to tell you that. Stop following God to answer your prayers. Follow him simply because he's sovereign. And he made you. Stop asking God. Answer, answer, answer. Look, sometimes he will not answer you. His answer is no. He won't. Get to a place in your Christian walk, whether God answers or not. Tell him, Father, wherever you are going, I told him, I said, God, if you remove heaven and hell, I'll still follow you. Whether you answer any prayer again in my life or not, I will follow you everywhere. If I perish, I perish. And be ready to perish. I don't care. If we perish, we'll go to heaven. Yes. What do you fear? Be radical for God. Be militant. Don't let any devil tell you rubbish. The second thing, as I begin to close. Ah, right, watch my time. The second thing. So the first is what? Who remembers? Confront what? Men confront the facts. As brutal as they are. Confront it. I love the guy, Nick Vujicic. The Christian evangelist. Born without legs or arms. Nick V. Nick Vujicic. You know him? Check him out on YouTube. Check it out. Nick Fujisic is a Christian like you and I. He has no legs, he has no arms. Yet, he's one of the most popular Christian evangelists in the world today. If it were you and I, what would you do? What would you do? The guy is all over the world preaching the gospel. You, you have legs and arms like me and you are crying. Chike, you better wake up. Wake up! This morning I watched a video on him to motivate myself. I watched that. I watched on video. I said, "Look at this man. No legs, no arms. Are you here? You are going to preach. You have legs and arms. What are you complaining for?" The second thing you must do. My time is up. The second thing you must do. Listen. When you're going through stuff in life, as you're waiting for God to answer, listen to me. You need to begin to find meaning. In the pain, the problem, and the trouble. You do you hear me? F find meaning in the pain. Listen to me. Sometimes God is calling your attention. He needs to reform your character. He needs to reform you so you can go and bless others. God uses pain to reform people. Get that right in your chicken. Get it right in your head. Christianity is not a park in the walk. I mean, sorry, in the walk in the park, rather. You will go through something. Find meaning in your pain. Discover meaning. God, what are you trying to tell me here? What are you trying to tell me? You know, guess what? It was in my pain I saw those guys at Denny's restaurant. My pain led me to Christ. It was pain that led me to Jesus. Before 26, if I had died straight to hell. Hello? Did you hear me? If I had died before 26, I would have gone straight to hell. I used to go to church. One hour service. I won't call the church. I didn't learn jack. I would run back into my sin. Yet I came from a good family. My life was a mess. Until God struck me with pain. And the pain led me to Jesus. I found meaning. I found the greatest meaning, pastor. Pastor. In my pain, I found God. As you go through difficulties, ask God, what are you trying to say here? What are you doing in my life? And finally, resilient people, you know what they do? I love it. They relentlessly pursue solutions to their problems. Hey, they are proactive they relentlessly pursue their... Pro Look at those Hebrew boys. 
We're going there. Whether we die or not, they don't care. They got in there. They were very aggressive. Look, become solution-oriented, not problem-oriented. There's a difference. People who are problem-oriented, they barely ache about the problem all the time. People who are proactive, relentless with solutions, they pursue solutions head-on. So that's the third thing about resilient people. They're very, very proactive when it comes to solutions. And guess what? In there, they learn their lessons. What can I learn from this pain? What can I learn from this problem? All right? All right. Can we pray? My time is up. Can we pray? Yeah, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father, Lord, you have spoken to your people today. Thank you so much for what you've done in this house. Father, may your holy name be praised. May your name be blessed. I pray God that somebody's life will change today from this message. Let somebody catch fire here. Let somebody become a militant and a radical for you. Let somebody understand that Father, you are God and you are sovereign. And no matter what they're going through, Father, they are in your presence. Let them change. Let their lives be transformed today, Lord. Father, I bless you today. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I give you praise, glory, and honor belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, church. God bless you.